Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge uh, there's plenty of help gone into this presentation and the work behind this presentation. Uh, so I'd acknowledge Mick Lyons in particular and also Jenny Davison, Rowan Kimber, Andrew Ware and the, the Pulse Breeders from um, the Pulse Breeding Australia program. So I'm going to give you a quick update on new varieties um, and uh, I'll go quickly run through. There's some in faba bean, philpea, chickpea and lupin. Um, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on lentils, there's a few issues around lentils and, uh, and then have a look at a bit of the crop topping uh, trial research uh, we've done. So that's the outline. So I'll get straight into it, to uh, faber beans. There is a new faber bean variety available, um, PBA Rana, developed by Jeff Paul and his uh, group at the university. <laughs> it's derived from Manifest. Uh, you've probably heard a bit about it. It's a large seeded uh, faber bean, about 20-25% larger than what we were used to in the Nura type size, suited to the Egyptian market and uh, it's got improved acid chitin blight over, over all current faber beans and chocolate spot rating similar to Nura. If we look at the long term yields including last year's, um, it, it, it is down a bit on yield generally, it's, it's probably around 5%, 5 to 10% lower yielding um, across the board but when you look at specific adaptation its best yields um, have been um, in the southeast, and you can see here it's quite close to Nura in the southeast, and also um, in the in the higher rainfall areas of the mid north and, and um, the Adelaide hillside areas, uh, Fleurie Peninsula areas where they're growing beans. So it's been a bit uh, closer to Nura in those areas. It offers a um, a, a good replacement, uh, a large seeder replacement, and its other um, key attribute is its uh, improved seed quality. Uh, as far as uh, staining goes and its actual visual appearance. It's got a nice light brown, uh, large plump seed and uh, this is some work from Rowan Kimber's lab, um, some seeds which came out of the 2010 season where acid blight infected the trials and you can see the advantage of having improved both the foliar and the pod resistance of PBA Rana on the, the seed appearance. Um, if you just if we just have a look at some of that work coming out of out of those uh, results, oh, can you see the light colour? No, gone. Well, that was a good uh, good default setting on um, on the new version of PowerPoint. Anyhow, we can we can just concentrate on um, the 2009 Rowan's work. Was uh, this is a seed index rating? Um, uh, so the, the larger the bar, the more, more disease staining there was. And in 2009 it was due, due to PC bore mosaic virus and in, the, in that year PBA Rana had lower levels than, uh, than all other um, varieties uh, with the seed staining. And in 2010 it was due to Ascochita blight, but Nura and uh, PBA Rana had similar uh, seed staining levels and they're all better than the other varieties. And, and the northern variety Dozer was way out here somewhere. Um, we also did some work uh, at Tali, a uh, time of sowing trial, and the early sowing date here is uh, marked by the, um, the lighter coloured bar, at least you can see the errors here. Um, and in this case uh, it was a combination of it was a combination of disease and weather staining as well. We, we didn't harvest this trial until uh, due to the rain until late um, December and it was quite common in 2010 for that to happen in favour beans in the mid north. And uh, so it's a combination of disease and staining and you can see in the early sowing time and again Rana had lower levels um, than uh, the other varieties apart from Nura and at the, at, at the later sowing time again um, a much lower count of staining compared to the other varieties. So that aspect um, is something worth considering particularly where people are having trouble with um, uh, acid blight and other staining on favour bean seeds. Uh, two new field peas and uh, their main claim uh, to fame is, is bacterial blight. It's something we're actually quite excited about in the program because bacterial blight has been a major issue for um, field pea production in, in New South Wales around the Wagga area but also uh, in Victoria. But um, for us it's also a bit of an issue east of Clare and, um, and north of Clare in that sort of uh, colder frosty area through there where some guys have actually gone out of field peas uh, because of the, the incidence of bacterial blight. So two new varieties, uh, PBA Percy and PBA Ura. And you can see, this is in inoculated trials in Horsham. Um, you can see here the, uh, 
the, the level of tolerance. PVA Percy is a conventional type like Parafield, and this is Casper. This is where the, we, we inoculated the trials with Seringi, um, and Casper here again versus Ura. Uh, this line, PVA Percy, does have the best level of um, resistance to uh, bacterial blight. This is some work from a colleague of ours, uh, Dr. Eric Armstrong in Wagga. He heads up the uh, bacterial blight screening work for PVA field peas. And uh, he's done uh, yield losses over four years. And you can see, as I said, PVA Percy uh, has been the best line for, for uh, reduced yield loss to bacterial blight. This is compared to uninoculated treatments, inoculated versus uninoculated. Uh, Ura is just slightly better than Parafield in, in these yield loss trials, but it has, has the same rating as Parafield. But this is what we, um, Eric's been finding uh, in Wagga with, with, with Casper in these trials, so 40%. So um, a, a, a quite a, a, a massive improvement and something we're uh, pretty pleased to be able to get out to growers, um, particularly where bacterial blight is limiting production. Uh, I'll just talk a bit about fill pea yields and um, there's, there, I've received a fair bit of uh, comment about how gunya and uh, twilight, PVA gunya and PVA twilight, which for those who don't know are the early flowering Casper types which have been out for a couple of years now, and ha how they're fitting in, and then I'll just show you where um, PVA ura fits as well on, on that um, for those interested in the bacterial blight option. But just uh, this is a, a regression graph with um, variety yield uh, on this axis and on the x-axis the uh, site mean yield and I just started with Casper and Parafield because you'll, you'll be familiar with that um, where, where we get low, low uh, average yields or lower rainfall situation Parafield generally does a little bit better than Casper and then as, as the site mean yield the rainfall increases um, Casper offers quite a substantial yield over Parafield. So I've just cluttered the whole thing up now while trying to put Twilight and Gunya on there. I've dropped out the, um, the red dots of Parafield um, so it doesn't clutter up too much, but I've left the line there so you can see the benchmark. But what's happening, um, but, but basically uh, Twilight and Gunya are running uh, the other side of Parafield and they don't cross over with Casper till over the, the, about two and two and a half ton mark um, in our trial work while uh, Parafield was crossing over at about one and a half or even a bit less, 1.2. And then if you follow them up, they're, they're both substantially higher yielding than Parafield as we get into higher um, production systems. And Twilight does tend to fall away a bit from um, Casper at the high end. So what, what I want to say is that a lot of people have been saying that uh, Casper and uh, Gunya and Twilight aren't offering them anything over Casper and basically the last two years all the dots in our trial work are sitting in here because we, we've hardly had a P yield trial yield under two ton and so really we're not expecting to see Casper and Gunya yield better, uh, uh, Twilight and Gunya yield better than Casper in those situations. Um, it's down here where we're going to get reliability of yield uh, from those earlier flowering options. And so it was years like 2007, 2008, which was where we were getting better yields from those. The, the good news is, is that they are substantially uh, higher yielding than Parafield and not a lot below Casper at, at, at that higher end. Um, and I'll just throw uh, uh, PBA Ura over it as well. And it, it, it's actually got very good broad adapt adaptation in South Australia. It actually sits outside all those varieties and just crosses over Casper here you know, when you get past three and a half tonnes. So it's actually, perform it's an early flowering variety and performing very similar um, to uh, Gunya and Twilight for yield in those lower rainfall regions. But it doesn't have the, the sh um, sugar pod characteristic for shadow resistance of Casper, uh, nor does it have um, the, the Casper seed type. So that's where I was going to leave it on field peas. Uh, just a quick update on chickpeas. Um, <coughs> Chickpeas are still a good option um, where people can grow them and grow them reliably. And there were some pretty good yields last year in many areas with chickpeas. Um, the, the only perhaps uh, um, objection to that was in the Adelaide Plains where some cold temperatures uh, during flowering and potting again saw large amounts of uh, seed abortion and, uh, and, and failure to set good seed in that area. Um, one new variety, cow key. Uh, it was previously tested as Genesis 115. Um, it's a large cedar kabuli, nine millimetres. It came out of the other medium cedar kabuli, Genesis 114. 
Uh, it's slightly later flowering, yield similar to 114, and like 114, it's, it's only um, MRMS for acicata blight, so we'll need some protection mid season. But like the, the Almaz and the 114, these large, medium to large cedar cabaldis are yielding around 20% less than Genesis 090. So it's all about getting premiums with the seed and you need to be able to get the large seed to get those premiums. So it's really about longer growing season and soils which can hold a bit of moisture to finish things off. And quickly, uh, uh, one new lupin variety, for, mainly for Western Australia at this stage, PVA Gunyidi. It's a mandalite replacement of improved shattering torrents and um, it, it may be available in the eastern states in 2013 but it's not available at this stage. So move over to lentils. There's been quite a bit of talk on lentils in the last uh, day and a half. Um, hopefully we can uh, put some, some positive news onto, uh, onto some of these stories and also clean up some, perhaps some of, the, uh, some of the rumours going around about different things as well. I've just put here the, the graph of the yields as a bit of an introduction to, to where things are sitting because there is a large lot of variety choice in lentils. We went 10 years basically on nugget and now in the last two years we've got five or six other varieties to choose from. Um, so if we look at these two years in 2008, 2009, you can see we we're getting 20% you know, plus yield advantages out of varieties like Flash and, um, and PBA Flash and PBA Blitz due to the, the, the quick, quick finishes and dry finishes. And, uh, and also PBA Jumbo uh, was doing okay as well, uh, offering, uh, it's a high yielding variety and that was offering you know, 10 to 20% yield advantage in those seasons as well. We've now gone into a couple of seasons which have behaved very similarly in, in, in 10 and 2011 and you can see the variety of performance is pretty similar across those two years. Um, and, and, and basically all we've seen is, is similar to the pea story that we're not getting the advantages of flash, the early maturity of flash and blitz uh, over the last couple of years. But you can still see the high yielding ability of flash and jumbo and still giving us a little bit of, um, of yield advantage over the old nugget even in a year which doesn't uh, favour, well, well favours nugget more, the, the mid season and later season varieties. And I guess another new variety release and something again we're pretty ex uh, keen about is uh, PBA Herald. Um, it's the first herbicide torrent lentil. I'll talk about it more in a minute but just where it fits um, without any changes in herbicide usage. It, it, it's, it looks like it's yielding around 5, 5 to 10 percent below nipper at this stage. Uh, it's a little bit later flowering and, um, and uh, it's, it's probably just a little bit poorer adapted than, uh, than nipper. So, um, that's where it sits at the moment. So what is PBA Herald for those who don't know? It's, uh, it's the first herbicide torrent lentil. Um, it's got improved torrents to flumetsusulum or, or broadstrike which is registered in lentils. It's also got improved torrents to some group B residues and improved torrents to some other um, uh, group B herbicides. It was developed by uh, Michael Matern and, uh, and the PBA group and um, at this stage there's been no herbicide uh, registration changes for production of lentils. Uh, there is work going on to both to see what we could potentially get registration for and also as far as um, seeking uh, a registration, getting the registration process in, in, in some herbicides underway and Wayne's been involved in that process through Pulse Australia. This is a photo here of uh, Herald and Flash on a Group B um, herbicide residue and you can see um, even though there won't be any plant back changes, um, some, of the, some of our soils still, even if you adhere to plant backs, you, we can still see uh, poor performance of lentils uh, because of a high pH and, and light soil texture. So you can see the good advantage there of, of the tolerance of PBA Herald. It's also got the highest level of disease resistance. Um, of all lentil varieties. So it is even better than nipper, which is a, a good plus. Um, the, the one downside or a downside of it is um, it, it does appear to be similar to nipper for metribuzin and um, that is something I would urge caution on uh, metribuzin applications on PVA Herald. This is one of the trials. We're doing a number of trials uh, which Mick and um, Jason Brand are, are running around the South Australian Victoria to, to help with uh, understanding what we can do with this um, uh, new technology in lentils and 
The first point to note is, or here's the nil of, of, of Nipper and Herald. This is at Pinery, so quite a reactive so light soil. And uh, you can see that um, the yield's pretty similar between the two with, with no herbicide. Then uh, when we come with the broad strike, interesting here, even at the recommended rate of broad strike, we're getting a significant, you know, half a ton, almost half a tonne yield loss at the recommended rate in Nipper. Um, I'm sorry, it's even greater than that, but Nipper compared back to here. And then when we double broad strike up, the double the rate up, um, you know, a, a, a major yield loss in Nipper and PBA Herald showing that improved tolerance looking pretty good. Um, then we're running a whole range of different Group B products over it. Um, at this stage uh, there is a registration process for one of those um, products underway and uh, also we're looking at a whole number of other options. And Without wanting to go through them because I haven't got time, but just to show you that you can see the red bars um, are way, way in front of the blue bars in some of these products. Um, this, this is uh, grain yields, obviously. And the other um, point is that there, there are some products where the tolerance isn't that good. And in this season last year, we actually had a fair bit of recovery. And if we just show you, these scores up here are the damage scores, the plant damage. So some of these products where there's no, actually no yield loss, but we actually got 63% um, uh, herbicide injury in, in the PBA Herald. So there was a good recovery last year. So some of these products we are going to have to be a little bit careful with, and that's why this work is ongoing before we go holus bolus into um, what we can and cannot put on this new lentil. And just as a word of warning, I guess, um, this was when we were uh, uh, over in Canada uh, last year visiting Linda Hall and some of our other colleagues in Canada. This is from the, um, the Regina Plains, and uh, this is a lentil crop, uh, an Emi lentil crop with um, uh, Group B resistant um, wild mustard all through it already. So uh, they've, they've got major issues with weeds in their lentils over there. They've got, uh, as Linda pointed out yesterday, they've got um, uh, wild mustard now resistant to, to their clear field technology, um, but also they've got issues with bed straw and, and kosher as well. So I guess something we have got to be aware of as we embrace this new technology and, and learn off of some of their lessons. A quick uh, update on, on PBA Blitz, and we might throw this over to um, questions afterwards, but this, this is um, uh, some, some of the things which came up last year, the first year of growing this lentil variety widespread. And uh, we see PBA Blitz as a, a key, having a key role in short season areas, dry years, and also for the practice of crop topping due to its early maturity, its very good disease resistance, and, um, its, uh, and, and its good yield, high yield potential. So last year we saw a few things. One of them was this, uh, what's been now determined as the pale sea coat colour in Blitz. And uh, th this, uh, they do look a bit like a flash type, but they are, they've been proven through DNA work to show that they are PBA blitz but just showing a recessive um, colour trait and um, a, a recessive sea coat colour trait. This doesn't have any effect on the, uh, the kernel and it doesn't have any effect on the splitting ability of, of PBA blitz but it does have effect on the visual appearance obviously which lentils are initially marketed on before they are processed. Um, so industry is meeting and uh, both in Victoria and South Australia, because we see this variety as, as I said, having a key role and we do want to be able to try and accommodate it if possible. So industry is currently getting together a recommendation um, to go to the Standards Committee that to potentially um, look at it, having an allowance for, for uh, seed types of the, the same seed types but with different uh, contrasting colours and getting that uh, potentially expanded for blitz. But that, that is a process which is ongoing and um, it's basically watch this space at this moment. I guess the, the, the small advantage of a nugget I've touched on, um, some shattering observations and uh, some isolated reports of an orange marking near the embryo um, in, in Blitz but, and also in Jumbo, PBA Jumbo. And I just want to perhaps look at what happened last year to explain um, that a little bit. So uh, this is a, at our Arthurdon site and the rainfall along the bottom here. And up here I put where Blitz started flowering and where it matured and where Nugget flowered and where it matured. And, and 
what I want to just show here is that basically we had this six, five to six week dry period and that was pretty widespread across South Australia. Blitz was well into flowering, in fact it finished flowering before the rain came on the Parsky field days. Uh, on the other hand, Nugget being later, it kept on going and flowered into the rain. Um, and then Blitz, being an early maturing variety, matured around here and you can see it was still a few rain events came after it. But there's going to be some seed on Blitz which is obviously mature or very close to maturity when these significant rain events happen. So some of the shattering is probably due to, um, some of the, sh the, the shattering we saw in Blitz is probably due to rain on seeds which were mature or pods which were close to maturity. Um, and, and perhaps some of these other, uh, like the orange mark we have seen on it, is, could also be due to rain events um, on the seed as it is maturing. And you can see here Nugget you know, matured a bit later and probably after the mo most of that rain. How are we going? I've got to finish? All right. I'll, I might just, I'll just quickly mention, so we're going to questions, but just to maybe we can talk about this in questions if you're interested. We are running crop topping trials. And it's basically being uh, uh, that we've decided to do this to come up. We've recognised that pulses need to fit into um, into the farming system, and we need to control weeds in the um, uh, in the, the, the right resistant ryegrass. We need to control that in the in the pulse crop. So we're looking at a range of um, varieties, and uh, we have three or four different crop topping timings. And we're basically trying to come up with uh, the maturity timing we need for the breeders to, to, to breed for, which we won't suffer yield or quality losses in um, pulses. And we've done that over a range of um, uh, different crops. And um, I'll, have to fl I'll have to leave it, I think, so we're going to questions. But we have found variety differences which generally relate to um, maturity timing and also crop differences. But some of the, the couple of key points to take out of it are that varieties like Blitz are generally better adapt, uh, better suited to it than, than Nugget and in the peas, PBA, Gunya, Twilight and Ura have essentially lost no yield loss um, in three years of these doing this trial work compared to uh, even Casper, Almond and Parafield. And we are currently just looking at some quality work in that as well and one of the, uh, the initial findings we've come up with is that in chickpea and field pea uh, when we have used a very early crop top timing we have found an increase in uh, we have found an increase in uh, mould. So this is the number of mould seeds in the sample at the early timing, crop topping timing, and in field pea and chickpea we found um, an increase in, in, in the percentage of mould on the seed. So that's something we're following up a bit further. I'll leave it there for questions, Wayne. The alarm. How much um, herald seed is available? Uh, my understanding is there's plenty of it. Sorry. Oh, the question was how much PBA Herald seed is available and, and my understanding is that there's, there's plenty of PBA Herald available. <coughs> that right one? And there has been strong demand for it too. What research are you looking at with Blitz and the seed? Are you going to do some um, trials this year to determine whether the level is going to increase in your... Oh, the genetics suggest that we, because it's a recessive gene, that it will increase slowly. Um, so we're expecting um, we, we said there's, there's levels of around 0.1 to 0.8 at the moment. So the, the expectation is that that could in, in, um, increase slowly. Um, so some of those ones at 0.8 may go over the 1% the level, which is the current receivable standard for, for off types or, or uh, non varietal types, um, which it could get picked up under. So that's why we're talking to industry about getting it. Um, uh, potentially getting a, a loophole, or not a loophole, but getting a, a different uh, receival standard for, for Blitz, as is, exists currently in Aldinga. As far as uh, work goes, um, the, the orange tipping in PBA Blitz, which has come up with a, in a couple of isolated uh, cases, and it's a little bit of an orange tipping around the embryo, where the, where, where the actual uh, the cotyledon and the root tip come out of. And that, um, that we think is very environment driven. And, uh, and that graph I showed you where the rainfall coming at Blitz at maturity, we think there's uh, a lot to do with that. And uh, that, that's some work we can look at um, during the year. And that, that's poorly understood, although we do think there are varietal differences. We've, um, PBA Blitz is not the worst we've seen. Like we think PBA Jumbo generally has um, a greater incidence of the orange dipping. <coughs>